We live in the age of nostalgia. You've heard that hot tip before. It's nothing new. We hear it every year. Someone turns on word and starts to bemoan about how the American film is dying because of all of the sequels and remakes and remake sequels and prequels and comic books and cinematic universe sequel prequel remakes. I find these takes fairly silly myself. I mean, I can understand where they're coming from. Just take a look at the top 10 highest grossing domestic films of this year alone, as of this recording. Let's see, remake of an animated film based on a popular fairy tale, comic book, comic book, comic book, book, comic book, comic book, huh. You know, I think they may have something when the only films in the top 10 not based on an existing property are Dunkirk, Fast and Furious, and Despicable Me. Make of that as you will. But even then, I don't have the same doom and gloom as others cause well, this isn't new. Hollywood has a long history of making movies based on existing or popular works. Most of the greatest films ever made are based on a pre-existing property. Sure, many of these were being adapted for the first time, and Hollywood is relying on these more than ever, but that's just Hollywood chasing popular trends to sell a movie. It's happened before, it's happening now, and will continue to happen in the future. Which leads to one of Hollywood's latest adaptations of popular things, Ready Player One, a 2011 sci-fi novel by Ernest Cline and soon to be a movie released next year directed by Steven Spielberg. Marketed as the holy grail of pop culture, which has attracted both a lot of praise and a lot of hate. This book has been on my radar for a while now and since we're kicking off sci-fi month, I wanted to see what all the fuss is about. So, is the book the holy grail of pop culture? Good morning, good evening, good wherever you may be. My name is David Popovich, aka The Bookworm, and welcome to my review and analysis of Ready Player One. Or, let's do this. In the not too distant future of 2045, the world is in the crapper. Due to multiple factors that puts humanity on a downward spiral. The ongoing energy crisis, catastrophic climate change, widespread famine, poverty and disease, half a dozen different wars, you know, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. Hey, I know that reference. Leading to a world where most of the population lives in the stacks. Basically what would happen if trailer parks try to be apartments. Most people live in poverty, death and violence is an everyday occurrence, and the only thing most people can even hope for is a quiet, painless death. But what can people do to pass the time? Enter Oasis. The Oasis is a giant VR MMO video game which has become a daily part of people's lives, like Oz from Summer Wars, which if you haven't seen you should, it's one of my personal favorites. While the real world keeps getting worse and worse, more and more people move towards the VR world of Oasis, making the developer, James Donovan Halliday, the unprecedented success of the Oasis had made Halliday one of the wealthiest people in the world. But then he dies, which gets reported, but most people wouldn't care too much. A rich man died. Oh boy, can't wait to see which brat inherits his fortune while I eat deep fried rats. But that's the thing, Halloway doesn't have an heir. So what happens to his company and money? Well... It turns out Halliday made a video to air to the entire world on the day of his passing, and it, it shows his passion for everything 80s, cuz... A famous eccentric, Halliday had harbored a lifelong obsession with the 1980s, the decade during which he'd been a teenager. He then goes on about the game Adventure, which is noted for having the first easter egg ever in a video game. That moment meant so much to him as a kid, so he decided to create his own. I created my own easter egg and hid it somewhere inside my popular video game, The Oasis. The first person to find my easter egg will inherit my entire fortune. That fortune being valued at about 240 billion with a B dollars. All the player has to do is find three keys and beat three gates. First one to get the high score wins. But finding it won't be easy. The keys and gates are all hidden and one has to have deep knowledge not only of Halliday but the era he grew up in leading to a resurgence of 80s pop culture. Things begin to die down, leaving only a dedicated section of nerds to find Halliday's egg. 
Enter Wade, an orphan 18-year-old kid living in the stacks. Wade hates the real world. In his own words, the real world sucks. But the hunt for Halliday's egg has given him something to do, and he spends every waking moment in the oasis. He has had no luck figuring out where the first key is. That is until he connects the dots during a Latin class that the first key is hidden on the planet he goes to school. And luck of luck, he wins the first key, but now Wade will find himself forced into the spotlight, not only by the media and fellow players, but also the evil company, IOI. They have been trying to take control of the Oasis and plan to take the egg to turn the Oasis into. They would start charging a monthly fee for access to the simulation. They would plaster advertisements on every visible surface. The moment IOI took it over, the Oasis would cease to be the open source virtual utopia I'd grown up in. It would become a corporate run dystopia, an overpriced theme park for the wealthy elite. Basically what would happen if we lose net neutrality. Seriously, call your representatives. So the race is on as he meets unexpected allies and dastardly enemies as he pushes himself to fight for the very soul of the Oasis. So how's the book? Eh, it's fine. At best, it's just fine. Not bad, but not as good as some reviews would make you think. And marketing it as the holy grail of pop culture? It's a functional book. It moves at a brisk pace, has some great moments of emotion, and the nerd references can help give the book its identity. But after reading it, I wasn't as satisfied as most others, and I'll explain why. So, spoilers ahead, let's start with the most obvious point of critique, the pop culture references. The first thing anyone will tell you about Ready Player One is that it has a lot of references. Like, a lot of references. It has more references to the 70s and 80s than an entire season of Family Guy, and depending on your mileage, the references can make the book a fun read or an annoying one. Now on one hand, there is a reason for them. Since the treasure requires people to have an in-depth knowledge of Halliday's likes and hobbies, it would make sense that they need to get into the nitty gritty cause, you know, it could lead them to having 240 billion with a B dollars. So the book is filled with references like, but not limited to... Ghostbusters, Star Wars, Star Trek, Dungeons and Dragons, Atari Games, Marvel Comics, The Muppets, John Hughes, Betamax, Laserdisc, Lord of the Rings, and so much more! Look at how nerdy I am, you guys! I am a true nerd! Now having all those references isn't always bad. In fact, it helps clue us in into who Halliday was as a person and why someone like him would be into this kind of culture. But there are times where a reference is named not so much to advance the story or inform us on the characters, but just to be there for the audience cause, hey look, nerd. Sometimes they are subtle, other times they are in your face. Which leads to one of my main points of criticism, the structure is weird. Now the structure isn't exactly weird on the surface. If I were to boil the entire story down to its bullet points, you can see how one thing leads to another. On paper, the plot moves at a smooth, brisk pace that keeps you engaged and wants you to turn the page. But it's in how the book expresses these plot points that can make things feel off. One of the best examples is how the book talks about Halliday's history and how it keeps repeating it. The opening chapters are your standard main character telling the audience the world so we understand what's going on and why we should care. In turn, we are given most of Halliday's backstory up front. But then it tells us the same information again when Wade is in class, only this time with a few details that help Wade connect the dots to where the first key is. I was confused when that happened. It was like deja vu cause I read this a few chapters ago. Why didn't you trim that down to bring up the points we need to move the plot forward? This is one of the most prominent examples, but when you're reading the book, you can see there are scenes Klein will breeze over telling us what happened over showing us, even though some of those scenes would have been great to develop characters. Like when Wade and his best friend Ock have a falling out when Wade's attention is drawn to win the love of a popular female player. That would have been a good scene to foreshadow Wade's fall when he loses everyone he gained while playing the game. But it skims over it in order to get to the next plot point and make room for more references. And it doesn't just stop with the general structure, it even affects the characters. One example is the character of Irock. He's introduced as your standard bully character that you believe will become a thorn in Wade's side, if not act as a mirror of Wade. And he's important because he connects the dots when Wade gets the first key and spreads it all over the message boards, which brings IOI to Wade. But after Wade's meeting with IOI, he mentions how he will get back at Irock, and he doesn't. 
After that, Irock is never seen again, nor brought up by name. He just drops off because all he was meant to be was a prop to move the plot forward. And that's just a small example. But a bigger one is with our main, Wade. On the surface, Wade's arc is clear. He starts off as a lonely, self-absorbed, reality-hating, gaming-obsessed nerd, and over the course of the book, becomes more well-rounded, discovers the power of friendship, falls in love, and will work to make his reality better than escaping it in a fantasy. Clear and simple. But for the life of me, I don't know how he transitions from before to after. Really the only moment that seems to signal a change in Wade after he loses his friends is when he discovers the evil corporation is targeting them, as well as learning that the final part of the game requires teamwork. Which sounds fine, but when I was reading it, it just never felt like Wade made that transition. The surface elements were there, but there were a beat or two missing to really hit it home, which only makes the message of the character seem forced. And speaking of messages... Wheel of morality, turn, turn, turn. Tell us the lesson that we should learn. The message in the game is simple. Don't let fantasy distract you from reality. Because even if it sucks, it's more fulfilling because it's real. It's a pretty basic message to point out that while Halliday made one of humanity's greatest achievements, he himself never found true happiness, and in turn, maybe spending your entire time on the Oasis isn't a good thing. But that message seems weak at least in how the story expresses it. One being that Halliday has to directly tell the morality to Wade and in turn to us, which seems pointless since the book points out several times how Wade's obsession with the game has made him more antisocial. Even Wade says that himself. So the message is clear already, but what would have helped express those things more is if the game Halliday made reflected what he experienced and in turn reflect Wade's character growth but it doesn't. Not fully. Take the last level of the game. Before you enter, you need three keys, a clear showcase of Halliday wanting the winner to understand friendship. But after they open the gate, the game defaults back to first one to the top wins like everything else. Now, I'm going to propose an alternative to how the last part could have been played. Let's say Wade and the gang enter to find they are in a D&D style game, and then IOI enter shortly after. The rules are simple. Beat the monsters, get to the end, first one there wins. Already the odds are against our heroes, but they give it their all, fighting monsters one after another, using each other's skills and protecting each other, while the leader of IOI just throws his goons to take care of everything to rake up points. After many hard-fought battles, Wade and the game make it, but IOI got there first. They won the game. But then a twist. Turns out the AI using Halloween's avatar has been secretly keeping track of all the player's actions since getting the first key. Cause in reality, Halliday wasn't looking for the best player. He reveals how the game was a way to express his life experiences and in turn teach the player what he has learned. That games and media can be a great way to escape, but can also make us lose perspective on those that matter most. Friends, loved ones, working to help those in need instead of just using them for your own gain. So when he compares the leader of IOI to Wade, there is no contest regardless of score. The bad guy hates this, but he gets control alt deleted, and in the end, Wade wins. Which can then tie in nicely to the Willy Wonka motif. Remember, Charlie didn't win the chocolate factory for being the last kid standing, but showing he has a good heart and will do the right thing over making a quick buck. The book doesn't do that. Instead, stuff happens where Wade is the only good guy left, and he has to do a bunch of more pop culture references to get to the finish line before IOI. But hey, Tempest, but the one with the glitch, and holy grail, you like that? An adventure! You remember that? The game that inspired it all? Even though the whole framing of the game is basically that, but like, we won! Congratulations! Here's the morale of the story! There's gotta be a shorter way to say all this. If there's a shorter way to say all this, it's that the book feels shallow. Like, the book still function, things flow well and such, but when you really begin to look into it, you find there isn't that much to it. From the game, to the characters, to the pop culture references, they don't say anything too deep outside of a surface level. But. That's not the worst thing a book can do. It's still a functioning book, and my views on these things still fall under subjective opinion, so if anyone disagrees with me on any of these points, I don't have much beef to say on that. We all have different tastes and should enjoy the things we enjoy. However, 
there is one thing I actively hate and can't go without talking about. <sighs> now to admit, this is kind of a nitpick. It's only a line of dialogue, but it's just... So Wade is in love with this character named Artemis, and when they meet during the hunt, Wade really wants to be with her, but is skeptical that while she's female in the game, she may not be in real life. Leads them to have a conversation questioning each other, which leads to this. Are you a woman? And by that I mean, are you a human female who has never had a sex change operation? That's pretty specific. Answer the question, Claire. I am and have always been a human female. Now the issue I have isn't with the whole I don't believe you're really a girl thing. That's pretty standard internet stuff. And in fact, Klein challenges Wade's worldview when he reveals another character turns out to be a completely different person in real life. Challenging Wade's perspective, making him grow as a character, and adding some social commentary. But even then, that doesn't address this line. Just because you reveal Wade's white male friend is a black lesbian doesn't change the fact that that line is transphobic, nor the fact that he has no romantic interest with his best friend. You try to make a point, but the fact that the line never gets called out nor addressed again shows a serious lack of foresight by the author. I'm not saying Klein is transphobic. I don't know the man much at all. What I am saying is he didn't think this plot line through enough, even by 2011 standards. So with all that, does this mean I hate the book? I know I've been criticizing the book a lot, but that's because I have a lot of thoughts and opinions about stories. A lot of what I said is subjective, but while I think the book is more flawed than some people would like to admit, I can't really say the book is bad because with all that I said, this book was made for me. What I mean is, if I was younger, like in middle school or high school, I would have loved this book to death. I would get a kick out of the references. I would feel like Wade is somehow my spirit animal. And oh my god, the ending with Wade fighting as Ultraman against Mechagodzilla is so cool. Heck, the first part with Wade going against a Demi Lynch over a game of Joust is both surreal, awesome, and suspenseful. As much as I can find faults with the story, I can't say it wasn't a fun read at times, if not nostalgic. The book did stir some old feelings in me about why I love sci-fi, fantasy, just nerd stuff in general. So I can't even go to say the book is truly bad, so let's finally wrap things up. In the end of the day, I find Ready Player One to be at best a popcorn book. I do have some other issues with it, mainly outside stuff like how the film rights to the book were sold before the book was even published and that Klein is a screenwriter, so part of me wonders if he just wrote the book for the sake of getting a movie made of it, which he also wrote. But I don't really know much about the book business, so who knows, this could be normal practice. Not to mention there are some elements in the book that really hit home, the idea of being obsessed with pop culture, the rise of VR video games, the fact that all the politicians in this world are just movie stars, televangelists, and reality TV hosts hit way too close to home now more than ever. For me, I feel there are great ideas in the book, but it doesn't take them to the full extent that it could be. It's not as special as some people make it out to be, and saying it's the holy grail of pop culture, at that point you're trying to make yourself seem more important than you are. But if you like it, you're good. If you don't, you're also good. One of the great things about discussing art is providing our own backgrounds and experiences and hope to gain a better understanding of each other and the world. Anyway, that is my take on the book. But what is yours? Hey, thanks for watching! So, what are your thoughts? Did you enjoy Ready Player One or were you not impressed? I'm really curious to see what your take is, so let me know in the comments, leave a like if you enjoyed this video, and don't forget to subscribe because Sci-Fi Month will continue, but this time we're going to be tackling a true monster, and I'll show you what it means to truly hate. Till next time fellow bookworms, have a nice day.